Okay, let's continue our discussion of organohalogen compounds. Last time on Tuesday, we talked about the fact that many organic molecules contain halogens and that these molecules have various properties, some good, some bad, uh, and the halogen itself provides um, unique reactivity handles for us to be able to carry out uh, chemistry, and we're going to talk a lot about that in this video. Um, recall that Halogen compounds form covalent bonds that are polarized. So if you look at, a, for example, in this case, a particular carbon-chlorine bond, this carbon-chlorine bond is polarized where the carbon is partially positive charge and the chlorine is partially negative charge. And we can see this in the electrostatic picture um, map for chloromethane, where a lot of the red electron density is closer to the chlorine and there's a lot of plus charge on the carbon end. That actually makes this carbon atom uh, the reactivity center as an electrophile. If you're going to react it with electron-rich species, anything that's nucleophilic or electron-rich is going to interact at that carbon. Um, and so uh, this aspect or this polarity of the bond is what helps lead to reactivity. Now the polarity of the bond is described in a unit of Debye referring to a dipole moment, which is a a separation of charge and the distance between that charge separation. So there are two factors involved in actually calculating a dipole moment, um, but it is a standard measurement of uh, polarity. And we can see in the series of halomethanes that the dipole moment um, decreases typically as you go to the larger and larger um, halogen. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. Notice that fluorine, chlorine, and bromine are very similar. Iodine is significantly lower. There are two aspects to this as I said. Um, one is the uh, charge difference and that depends on electronegativity difference um, but also the distance. So as these atoms get larger of course the bond lengths increase as well. and So that has something to do with the overall dipole moment <clears throat> as well as the bond strength. And it really is the strength of the bond which is important when we talk about doing reactions which involve breaking this carbon-halogen bond. Uh, notice that the iodo compounds are weakest and hence most reactive. Um, and that decreases, the reactivity decreases as you get smaller and smaller halogens. And <clears throat> recall we talked about the fact that fluorinated molecules have significantly strong bond strengths and thus do not uh, participate in a lot of these reactions easily at all. As a matter of fact, in many cases, fluoro compounds are not considered as useful starting materials to do a lot of the chemistry that we do with chlorine, bromine, and iodine. Well, we uh, know several ways in which we can make organohalogen compounds, starting from alkenes. Uh, as we talked about, we can do our typical electrophilic addition to a double bond, where the double bond oops, let me back up, where the double bond will grab the proton from HBr and form an intermediate carbocation, uh, as we are very well familiar with now. So the hydrogen had added at this position, and then the Br- minus would react at that most substituted carbon, giving us a Markovnikov product. That's from previous chapters. This chemistry you should be well versed with by this time and be familiar with. Um, we can also add two bromines across a double bond to give the dibromo compound, as we've talked about and had on the last exam, uh, as well as other functionality. And I'll just remind you that, let's say we have an alkyne. If you add HBr to an alkyne, it can add typically twice. So you add two equivalents of HBr, in which case you'll get two Markovnikov additions of H and Br across those two pi bonds that are in the triple bond. Um, or if you add two equivalents of Br2, you'll end up with four halogens on the final product. So in that case, we'd have molecules such as that. Now, uh, alkene chemistry is great. Uh, in a lot of cases, we can introduce halogens, adding HCl, HBr, Br2, I2, for example. Uh, but it's not the only way we can make halogenated compounds. We can also make halogenated compounds directly from alcohols. And so here if you take uh, some alcohol group with a hydrogen halide, so you have to have an H plus and an X minus, so a 
electrophilic H and a minus uh, nucleophilic halogen or halide, you can do a substitution reaction where we have now broken the CO bond and replaced OH with the halogen. The byproduct is a combination of H and OH, and that gives us water as the byproduct. Um, now the source of the acid that we're using matters as well, so HF is the lowest reactivity, whereas HI is the highest reactivity, as for reasons we'll understand later. That's due to the fact that the halide is more nucleophilic. Uh, as well as the substitution of the substrate has an impact on the reactivity, where uh, less substituted alcohols are harder to do substitution on in these cases, whereas the most substituted tertiary alcohols are the easiest. Okay, and here's some examples of those differences that we talked about where a primary alcohol can react with HBr, but it requires significant heat to get that reaction to go. A secondary alcohol, uh, a little bit lower temperature, and the tertiary alcohol reacts the easiest to give us the brominated substituted product in uh, um, room temperature in this particular example. So it obviously gets easier for that reaction to proceed as you get more and more substitution of the carbon that the alcohol is attached to. Uh, recall uh, that reaction um, undergoes a similar kind of addition of Br- minus um, to an intermediate that we see from, oops, I went back again, that we see from the addition of, say, uh, a double bond to um, addition of HBr to a double bond. So take for example this molecule. If you add HBr to that, what happens is of course you first protonate the double bond. You get an intermediate which would give you the more substituted carbocation intermediate and then that in substituted carbocation reacts with the bromine to put the bromine in that position. Okay. Well, if you can think about <clears throat> accessing this carbocation intermediate from a different way, then we could get the same product starting from a different starting material than alkene. And in fact, we can do that with an alcohol. And the way this reaction works, as you can see here, instead of HBr, we have H2SO4, but it is essentially the same as having an H plus and a Br minus. So it's the equivalent of having HBr present. So what happens, of course, in a first step is the OH group takes the proton. Okay, so you protonate that OH group. We have an intermediate, which is now a protonated alcohol, which puts a formal plus charge now on the oxygen. And once we do that, we make this CO bond that is uh, to that hydronium group. So this particular CO bond becomes weaker. Uh, and what can happen is that bond will break. Giving those electrons to oxygen to neutralize that charge, we generate in that process the neutral water. Uh, and that forms the carbocation plus forms H2O. Okay, but notice we get to this exact same carbocation intermediate. The Br minus that we had initially is uh, what reacts then with that carbocation, and that's how we substitute overall this OH group for the bromine. So based on this particular mechanism and the fact that we have to generate a carbocation intermediate, it makes sense that the more substituted the alcohol is, the easier we're going to be able to form these carbocations. This substitution mechanism uh, is similar for other reactions that we do with alkyl halides, so I want you to keep this substitution reaction in mind as we move forward. Well, because that substitution requires the formation of a carbocation, it's difficult to do with primary and secondary halides. It works best with tertiary halides. So if we really want to do the reaction, say, of one propanol and carry out the substitution to make chloropropane, the way to do that is instead of using HCl, which is difficult, 
That's difficult. Oops, that's not an L. HCl, that's difficult. We can superactivate this into a good leaving group by using thionyl chloride. Uh, the way to remember this is simply this is just making it the oxygen or the OH group an even better leaving group than the protonated OH so that the chlorine, which actually comes from this reagent, can displace it and we get the chlorine. Because SOBr2 is a very reactive reagent and difficult to handle, the best way to do it to introduce bromine is to use, instead of SOBr2, we use a phosphorus tribromide. But what you need to remember is the overall transformation. A primary or secondary alcohol in the presence of SOCl2 or PBr3 will give the corresponding chloride or bromide product. Of course, as organic chemists, we're most interested in the transformation of the organic material to the organic product. Um, these byproducts are shown for clarity, so you have an idea about what might happen, but uh, generally we wouldn't write those in a particular reaction anyway. Um, we would, lay in a lazy way, just kind of ignore that. Okay, so we talked about all that on Tuesday, and so hopefully you have a good idea about how we can make organohalogen compounds. The question then becomes what kinds of things can we do with those organohalogen compounds once we have them? They are very very useful reagents to use in a lot of different reactions. We can um, change the reactivity of an organohalogen compound from being something which is electrophilic. So if you think about bromopropane here, it's got a polarized bond so the carbon it's attached to is partially positive. The bromine end is partially negative. Okay, And so what happens in chemistry we're going to talk about in a little bit is that if we have a nucleophile, nucleophiles will interact with the carbon. Well, one of the things we can do is change the polarity. If we take magnesium metal, magnesium in its zero oxidation state, it's just magnesium metal, and we mix them together with organohalogen compounds, what happens is that the electrons from magnesium will actually flow towards the carbon and the magnesium metal itself will insert in between the, the carbon bromine bond. And so what we end up with is um, a molecule which looks like this on the right where we have instead of the carbon bromine bond we have a carbon magnesium bond and then magnesium bromine. So between the carbon and the bromine, the magnesium metal has inserted in between. Notice now, magnesium, we start as metal in the zero oxidation state. In this product, the magnesium, if you look, think about the oxidation state of the magnesium, it's magnesium in the plus two oxidation state. Now, think about the polarization of the carbon bond in the product. In the carbon bromine bond, the bromine is more electronegative and so the bond is polarized with the carbon end being plus and the bromine being minus. Well think about now we have a a carbon metal bond, in this case magnesium, so I'll just say magnesium. Okay, What is the difference in electronegativity between a carbon and a magnesium metal? Well, clearly carbon is much more electronegative than the magnesium. So this bond is actually now reversed. The polarity of this bond between the metal and the carbon, those electrons are polarized towards the carbon. So in the product, we have a very different situation than we do in the starting material. This product, um, the Grignard reagent, instead of being a carbon plus, now we have a carbon with a with a partial negative charge and a magnesium with the partial plus charge. So it's polarized in this direction. This now becomes equivalent to a carbanion in reactivity. So we've taken what is a species on the left side which is typically an electrophile. It's looking for some nucleophile to react with and it becomes a nucleophile. We change the reactivity. Now these types of carbon metal bond compounds, when we have a, a molecule with a carbon metal bond, um, we refer to these compounds as organometallic compounds. Organometallic. 
compounds because <clears throat> it's organic compound with a carbon metal bond. This particular type of reagent prepared from any organohalogen compound in magnesium metal to form the magnesium organometallic species was uh, generated first by a chemist named Victor Grignard, and Victor Grignard now has his name on these. Anytime we have these magnesium reagents, we refer to them as the Grignard reagents. We will see in a later chapter, these are great nucleophiles for doing additions to carbon-oxygen double bond compounds. So something like this, we can add a Grignard reagent to, and I'm just using a generic um, R group, followed up by a proton source or an acid. We end up with addition of that carbon nucleophile and breaking the CO double bond. That's chemistry we'll learn in a later chapter, but that's one of the best utilities of these Grignard reagents um, that can be generated directly from organo halo compounds. <clears throat> By the way, it doesn't work just with alkyl bromides, but we can do the same thing. We can generate the same kind of reagents from, say, bromobenzene. Bromobenzene in the presence of magnesium metal will generate the phenyl magnesium bromide. Again, the key thing here is we have a carbon metal bond, and so this is the equivalent of a benzene compound now with a carbanion as a nucleophile. Okay, So we can do this on sp2 halogen compounds as well quite easily, and that works uh, very well for many situations that we want to use these carbon groups as nucleophiles. Well, besides organometallic chemistry, Grignard reagents, and actually there are many other organometallic reactions, <clears throat> two of the most common reactions of alkyl halides is uh, the reactions shown here. <clears throat> that is, in the presence of some kind of nucleophile, a carbon-halogen bond carbon halogen bond can be replaced with a bond to a nucleophile, a substitution reaction. So in this case what's happening is that this bromine is being replaced by an OH. Now notice that's the opposite of the addition of HBr or the substitution of OH with Br under acidic conditions. This happens to be under non-acidic conditions uh, and it's the reverse of the reaction which we could use to generate HBr. <clears throat> so there are some analogies here to the direction or the mechanism for that reaction. Another possibility uh, for the generation of, uh, uh, or for the reaction of alkyl halides is an elimination reaction. So notice this bromine is attached to this carbon I've highlighted right here in red. Uh, we could take off an adjacent hydrogen on an adjacent carbon by using a base. So instead of a nucleophile replacing, doing a substitution, OH- could act as a base and take that proton. These electrons in this could flow down and form a new double bond, kicking off the bromine. So in this case, we can generate a carbon-carbon double bond uh, the byproducts are water and the salt of the bromide, depending on whatever salt we started with the hydroxide. So if this is sodium hydroxide, uh, what we end up with is sodium bromide in the end. Now since what, uh, well, we've taken off the equivalent of HBr, uh, so that's essentially what we refer to as an elimination reaction. Notice that the reverse of this would be the addition of HBr to a double bond. So the reactions that we talk about for introducing halogens into molecules from an alcohol or from a double bond, these are the actual the reverse of those reactions in many respects. Again, depends on the particular situation. Uh, to go in the left direction, it's under acidic conditions, and to go to the right, it's under basic conditions. Okay, so let's focus a little bit more carefully at the substitution reaction. One of the things that uh, was observed early on 
in actually in the 19th century, in 1896, a chemist named Walden was studying the substitution chemistry of malic acid. And now these substitution reactions are a little bit different. Notice in this case to substitute OH with chlorine, he's using PCl5. Think about preparation of halogens. That's another way in which we can introduce halogen by superactivating the OH to leave. So let me just say that what happens is the phosphorus activates the OH, makes it a good leaving group, but then a, one of the chlorines from this reagent is the nucleophile which substitutes that. So what I haven't shown in this picture is that the stereogenic center that the oxygen is attached to, this is a carbon with four different groups attached, uh, there are two possible enantiomers of that. And I haven't indicated the stereochemistry here. I've just used a, a regular line to indicate the bond. But in fact, if Walden started with one particular enantiomer, the one which rotates plane polarized light uh, to the left, or the negative direction, um, this is referred to as the minus malic acid, minus referring to the direction of rotation of the plane polarized light. When he, carries out the, when he carried out the reaction to do the substitution of OH to form the chlorine product, he observed also a, a molecule which was enantiomeric and, and one enantiomer, which was the minus isomer of chlorosuccinic acid. So this stereocenter was fixed, and this rotated light in the minus direction. Now he did another nucleophilic substitution reaction on the carbon-chlorine bond. In this case, silver oxide is actually forming the base, uh, a base in this reaction, and we're using uh, then OH minus, or water produces OH minus as the nucleophile, and that substitution occurred to give us back malic acid. However, when the optical rotation of this product was determined and measured, it actually turned out to be rotating the light in the plus direction. So we have generated now plus malic acid. So that's interesting. That's very interesting. And if you repeat that chemistry from the plus malic acid to the same thing and convert it into the chlorine, you get the plus chlorosyl succinic acid. And if you do the same substitution with hydroxide, you get back the minus malic acid. So this has been referred to as the Walden cycle. Uh, and that observation of the stereochemistry started people thinking about what might be happening in these substitution reactions. So notice, when we do these substitutions, the stereochemistry, let's say for example, uh, we, well, I don't know which is, which is the minus one up or down, but let's just say uh, we start with the one where the OH is only up, and we end up in this sequence getting the molecule where that OH is going to the back. In other words, we have inverted the stereocenter. And it's not racemic. We don't get a mixture, 50-50 mixture. It inverts completely. So you have to ask the question, can we come up with a detailed mechanism that would explain that? Well, let's take a look. In any nucleophilic substitution, there are several parameters that we need to consider. And it actually turns out that there are several different mechanisms by which a nucleophilic substitution can take place. So we have some electrophilic species, some, some or alkyl halide species, for example. It could be a carbon-chlorine bond, a carbon-iodine bond, or a carbon-bromine bond. And then we have some nucleophilic species, typically with a negative charge, although some nucleophiles can initially be neutral. Um, but typically they have a, a negative charge, and what happens is a substitution for the halogen uh, bond for the nucleophile bond. Okay, so the nature of these species, there are a number of things we can think about for the halides. As I said, uh, we have many different halogen compounds, and I would say in 
most of this chemistry, the fluorines don't work. Um, iodines work the best, but iodine, bromine, chlorine can do this chemistry. <clears throat> and alkyl only does this chemistry. We can't do it on bromobenzene, for example. That's a whole different process when it's sp2 hybridized. The nucleophiles can be <clears throat> the negatively charged ions of various things. So I've shown you hydroxide, but it could be something like an alkoxide. So let's say like uh, the negative charge of methanol, methoxide. Um, it could be a carboxylate. Um, there are many different kinds of nucleophiles. It could be a thiolate. It could be a cyanide. It could be an azide. It could be, as we saw in the last chapter, it could be an acetylide, right? We know we can introduce carbon groups from alkyl halides onto these and generate those by deprotonation. So there are many kinds of different nucleophiles. They could be amines. Um, we could have some kind of nitrogen compound. So that nitrogen can be a nucleophile to do substitution. <clears throat> that lone pair is reactive. Um, it could be an alcohol. It could be many things. Anything that has lone pairs to donate, the question then is just what is the strength of that nucleophile? Uh, so as we see as we go along, there are many different things that we can use to substitute uh, a halogen compound for in these substitution reactions. Well, in order to explain the substitution mechanism, uh, one way to think about that stereochemistry or the reaction is to think about the nucleophile reacting with the positively charged carbon and the leaving group, in this case the carbon-halogen bond, departing from that carbon. And this could happen all in one step. So on the left of this reaction, what you can see is our starting materials. We have, in this case, iodomethane and OH minus is the nucleophile. We know that the carbon iodine bond is polarized, carbon plus and I minus. That makes this bond polarized in that direction. Okay. So as you go from one uh, side of this equation, the starting materials over to the products on the right side, where we now have replaced the CI bond with a new CO bond, uh, this could occur at the same time. So think about these electrons actually attacking that carbon while the iodine is breaking. And at the intermediate transition state, halfway along or at the top of that energy diagram as the reaction proceeds, what you have on one side is the OH bond being formed, so this is incoming, and the carbon iodine bond breaking to form I minus. The electrons are going with the iodine, here the, on the left, the electrons are coming from the OH minus. In the product, we end up with iodide and then the new carbon-oxygen bond. So this is a one-step reaction. Happens If this is all happening in a single step, you have simultaneous bond making and bond breaking for the changes that are happening as you go from the left to the right. Uh, this is what we refer to as a mechanism called SN2. So let me explain what that means. The S stands for substitution. Substitution. So we're doing a substitution reaction. That's not so hard. The N stands for nucleophilic because we're adding a nucleophile in the form of hydroxide to the carbon. So hopefully that makes sense. A nucleophilic substitution, SN, and 2 refers to the rate expression. If this is a one-step reaction, then the rate of the reaction depends on both things interacting at once, both the hydroxide and the alkyl halide. So what that means is that there are two species involved, or the reaction is second order. First order in organohalogen compound and first order in hydroxide, it means overall two things coming together in the transition state. That's important for the rate of the reaction. 
Uh, so it's a second order reaction. So that's what the SN2 will signify. Now that makes sense, right? That makes sense with the stereochemistry. Here's another example of this SN2 reaction where we see the changes in the stereochemistry that take place. So if I take this chiral alcohol, which I've indicated here has an optical rotation of plus 33 degrees, and we do a substitution, uh, and we get the same alcohol back, but now the stereochemistry is inverted, and the way this is done is actually, uh, I wouldn't worry too much about this, but if we put a, a certain uh, functional group, replace the OH bond with a, a bond to this sulfur group, now this makes it a better leaving group. Better leaving group. The bond is more polarized. So this is um, sometimes referred to as analogous to um, a halide, this o -tosylate. It's got actually some even better reactivity than a halide in some cases. That can be substituted by an acetate ion. And notice what happens in this reaction. When we, when we do the acetate react and kick this off, if this happens all in one step, the stereochemistry inverts, and if we then hydrolyze the acetate to free up the alcohol, we get the opposite rotation. And we know that in this step, there was inversion of the stereochemical configuration. Okay, That makes sense if we have this bond making and bond breaking occurring at the same time in the transition state. So notice I've drawn an example of methyl, but let's say this carbon was a stereogenic center. If this carbon uh, now has uh, different groups attached here, when, when we go to the transition state, these groups start to move in this direction as, the, as that becomes planar. Um, and in the end, those keep moving as this bond breaks and this one comes in and we get inversion of that stereocenter. So in the transition state, you can see this quite clearly, that these hydrogens have moved um, and this carbon center, these continue moving in this direction as this iodine leaves, that this is inverting this, the configuration of the carbon, just like you would have like an umbrella in a windy day and those spokes invert. That's what's happening as this nucleophile comes in, it pushes everything else over and pushes this out. That's how we explain the change in the stereochemistry when we go from the left side of the equation to the right. In one step, if both of these bonds are being are are changing at the same time, bond making and bond breaking, uh, then they can't be on the same side. So we say that the OH group has to be uh, has to come in from the back side of the leaving group and 180 degrees away. So notice this is 180 degrees. Okay, So that transition state that we look at in this one step reaction explains what we see if this actually happens to be a stereogenic carbon. Okay, this, this addition of a nucleophile to the backside um, opposite of where the group the halogen is leaving uh, makes sense also when we consider the changes in the reaction depending on the degree of substitution. So if you look at this example where we are doing a substitution of a carbon bromine bond for a carbon iodine bond, here I minus is the nucleophile which is replacing the bromine. If this has to come in from the backside and kick the bromine off, it would make sense that uh, the more substituted that carbon is because it has to come in here. Methyl group is the easiest with the most amount of space. If you add one substituent, it gets a little bit more crowded. If you add two substituents, it gets more crowded. And if you have three substituents, it's so crowded that that nucleophile can't get into the backside. The reaction essentially does not proceed on a tertiary bromide. Uh, and it's fastest on methyl. So if you look at the relative rate, and you say uh, this secondary bromide reacts at a rate of 1, a primary bromide re reacts 1,300 times faster, and a, a methyl bromide will react over 200,000 times faster because 
it's less hindered, and the nucleophile can find and, and can get into the back easily to kick off the leaving group. So the sterics and the degree of alkyl substitution uh, greatly influences the success of this reaction. Methyl and primary work best, secondary can work. Uh, tertiary will not do the reaction under this mechanism. That's the slowest. Well, leaving groups also matter, and I'll just want to point out that uh, depending on the strength of the bond and the ability of the leaving group to stabilize the negative charge as it comes off, we also get reactivity based on that. So it, um, we saw that in the halogen series that the bond lengths, bond strengths decrease as you go to iodine um, from chlorine. Fluorine, if we set that as a relative rate of 1, which really isn't reactive, Notice, just kicking off something as an OH- minus or an NH2- minus is very, very difficult. Now we saw we could kick off a neutral water by protonating it first, but uh, without an acid or something to protonate it, um, OH- minus coming off is extremely difficult. For comparison, I mentioned that tosylate group. Uh, I'm not too concerned that you remember that, but the tosylate is also very, very reactive like a, a halogen, like an iodine. So weaker bonds, more stable anions makes for better reactions and, and, and we think about the leaving group, the halogen leaving group as being a better leaving group if you go in this direction. But that's not the only mechanism. There is another possibility and that is this possibility. If you have a carbon which can stabilize a carbocation. That is, the more substituted it is, there is a possibility that the halogen or the leaving group can bond can actually break before the carbon nucleophile bond forms. So instead of both happening at once, the carbon halogen bond breaks first to form a carbocation intermediate. That's reflected here on this energy diagram, so we actually have an intermediate. And then in a second step, the iodine, in this case, the nucleophile, I'm sorry, not the iodine, uh, in this case, our nucleophile is water. We end up with an OH group that could add to the carbocation. Since the carbocation now is, is absolutely planar and the p orbital lobes extend on both sides, the OH group could add on either side. In which case, if we start with a chiral molecule, that has one enantiomer we're reacting with, we actually end up with a racemic mixture, a 50-50 mixture, because we form a carbocation where all that stereochemical information is lost. Now this um, mechanism we refer to as an SN1 mechanism. And why is it an SN1 mechanism? Well, SN stands for, again, substitution nucleophilic, so it's a nucleophilic substitution. The one refers to the reaction order in the transition state step that is the rate determining step. So notice that the rate of the reaction depends only on the concentration of one species, the alkyl halide, because the rate determining step is this first step in the reaction. The nucleophile we're reacting isn't involved in that step at all. That comes at a second step, but since this is much faster, then the first step, it is the slowest step which dictates how fast a reaction goes. And that only depends on one species, this alkyl halide breaking the halogen bond to form the carbocation. So this is what we refer to as an SN1 mechanism. Now don't get confused. Um, this happens to be a two-step reaction. And that can sometimes be confusing because you can get this backwards. A two-step reaction is the SN1 mechanism. The one-step reaction, which involves nucleophile and substrate in the same, the two-step reaction, I'm sorry, the one-step reaction is the SN2 mechanism. Because uh, that's the two and one are referring to how many things involved in the slowest step. Okay? Um, when we think about the SN1 reaction, 
Here's the SN1 reaction. Obviously, for all those all the same reasons we've been talking about before, we're forming a carbocation. So it is the tertiary substrates which really react. Um, secondary substrates are much slower. As a matter of fact, about a million times slower than the tertiary. And primary and methyl won't form carbocations. So this is restricted only to the tertiary substrates for SN1 chemistry, although there are some rare examples of secondary uh, substrates forming those carbocations as well. So in this case, it's the opposite of the SN2 in terms of selectivity. Uh, I just want to point out that even, even with what I said about the stereochemistry of the SN1 reaction, you form a carbocation, you generate a planar system where the stereochemistry is gone and you form a racemic mixture. There are some rare occasions where we see some exceptions. So if we take this chiral bromide, carry out an SN1 reaction um, under these conditions, notice it's not strongly basic. We carry out the reaction under these conditions with water uh, in ethanol we see the alcohol produced not as a 50-50 mixture, that would be a racemate, but as an 83-17 to 17 mixture. With that, uh, and that's an interesting observation, and it actually is a little bit more complicated. It turns out that uh, it's still an SN1 reaction. It forms a carbocation, but what happens is the leaving group hasn't moved out of the way before the nucleophile comes in, and so we get a little bit more of what would be the inversion product, whereas if that leaving group moves away and you have the free carbocation, then we could get an equal mixture of additions to either side of that. Um, but for the purposes of this class, this is a very fine rare exception. Uh, in almost all cases when we do SN1 reactions to form a carbocation, you end up with a racemic mixture of products. Okay, so I just want to give an overall comparison of and summary of some of the things we've talked about when we talk about SN1 reactions versus SN2 reactions. So again, SN1 reactions are the two-step reaction. It forms a carbocation, cation, and the SN2 reaction is a single step which involves both the nucleophile and the starting material at once. So it makes sense that um, for an SN1 reaction that a tertiary carbocation is going to be favored, whereas in an SN2 reaction that's not and it's going to be primary and secondary which are favored uh, substrates for the halides that undergo these reactions. Um, with regards to the nucleophile uh, if you're forming a carbocation, that's the hard thing to do. So once you do it, even weak nucleophiles react okay. Whereas in an SN2 reaction, the nucleophile is involved directly in helping to push off the leaving group from the backside. So the better the nucleophile, the stronger the nucleophile, the better the reaction is. Um, in both cases, we do need to have good leaving groups, usually halogens, um, and the better, more stable those anions, the better. So I minus is better than Br minus, which is better than Cl minus, etc. If you have stereochemistry in your starting material, you'll get racemic products from the carbocation. You'll get inversion of the stereochemical configuration in the SN2 reaction, uh, and those are uh, represent a very good comparison between those two pathways and possibilities. Okay, so I want to stop our discussion here uh, and talk, which we, okay, so I want to just stop uh, this video at this point, uh, leave you with thinking about these two mechanisms for substitution of organohalogen compounds, the SN1 substitution and the SN2 substitution. When we meet next time, um, we'll, we'll revisit these substitution reactions and look at the comparison with another possible reaction, and that is the elimination reaction. I, I said that there were two pathways that organohalogen compounds can, can undergo, uh, either substitution where we've replaced the carbon halogen bond with a carbon nucleophile bond, 
or the deprotonation of a hydrogen and then subsequent loss of the halogen to form a double bond, the elimination reaction. We'll focus on elimination reaction in the next lecture.